I can see, woohoo, not you, but I can see the paper. How you doing? You're sleeping. How you doing? Yay! I am honored to be here this evening. My name is Kelly, and I'm a grateful Christian who's been in, living in recovery since 1997. I remain amazed at how my life has changed since then. Let's take, what? Oh, hi, Kelly. Oh, there was one still small voice, just a tiny little voice. My friend. <laughs> Let's take a moment to pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and enter this room. Fill the hearts of us. We are your faithful. Some of us are in this room. Some of us are in their homes. Some are in their cars. Some are at the park. Lord Jesus, all of those who have come to hear this testimony tonight, fill them with your holy grace. All those who really wanted to be here and are not, double it. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Woo! I love the Holy Spirit, okay? Like, he does stuff. <sighs> so, I come from an incredibly broken family. Like, Oh my gosh. Uh, so far, two of my six siblings have found a way out of the muck that we were born into. We pray for the others. Many things happened to me as a small girl and then by me as a teen and young adult that led me to recovery at the age of 25. I was fully broken by the world and by my own choices. Sinful hurts, habits, and hang-ups were all I knew and my heart was so very cold. I was unable even to try to be a decent person and had very few role models to turn to. My only focus was feeding my addictions and compulsions. I knew there was a void in my heart, but I couldn't tell you what was missing. My parents never once spoke anything about God. I don't remember ever hearing his name or anything about the theory of such a thing, ever. I'm not really all that comfortable talking openly about my story on camera. Sorry, guys. Uh, but I'll do my best. My mom was a heavy drinker. There were many pictures of her on there. Uh, my dad was a drug user. There are no pictures of him on there. They had my brother and I, and then split when I was six months old. They exposed us to some really awful people. I mean, like, wow, you brought your kids there? Uh, I began my journey of trying to escape the pain of you know, them people, by drinking alcohol when I was very young. And it worked for a little while. My mind was warped and my heart was broken in so many ways that it seemed I was doomed to live as my parents did. Several step families came and went. My dad finally settled with a woman who had three kids from two different dads. They were all very broken by life circumstances as well. The oldest and youngest stepbrothers were her two sons, and they're both in heaven now. Well, I hope they're in heaven. Uh, by God's grace, mercy, I hope to see them. My mom tried marriage several times before she met my papa. I was so sick by the time their wedding came around that I wasn't even allowed to go. <laughs> he had two sons that are younger than me. So if you're doing the math, there's seven kids, right? And seven parents. Mm. Uh, Chad and Jeremy, they're really good brothers, but they came from a broken family and have stories of their own to tell. Lucky for them, they got to see a side of my mom that I didn't. She was good to them. My brokenness took me down many really dark paths, relationships that I should never have been in with people that I should have never met. All I ever wanted was for the pain and all the memories to just stop, just, just shut off, just hit the switch. All that I did brought more pain and more horrible memories. There was no shutting it off. There was only growing that beast. It was not uncommon for me to come to uh, in places that I did not know around people that I had never met, doing things that shouldn't ought to have been done by anybody. The fear and anger in my heart and in my mind were completely unbearable. It seemed impossible to outrun, but I tried my very best. I really did. But the devil had me in his grip. I was running in place. My soul was dark, and I invited that darkness. The music that I listened to, the people that I hung with, 
The thoughts of hate and anger were all consuming, all the time. I didn't know any other way to live. I had not a clue. Bitterness and fear were so deep, I couldn't even see beyond it. I ran from one euphoric event to the next, hoping that it would last more than just a couple of hours. It never did. I always ended up in the black, dead emptiness of my own heart, with my mind racing for the next, next escape. I often let my mind turn to self-pity and thought about how awful my life had been. I was a champion victim, for sure. Uh, it wasn't just so that I could justify the way that I was living, but I found some kind of like freakish, weird comfort in that self-pity thing. It was like a blanket of darkness, and I clung to it in order to stay alive while I hoped to die with every single breath. I had a few friends that somehow hung on. Nobody knows why they're that demented. But I never took a ho told the truth of who I was to anybody. I didn't even know my own name. I didn't... I didn't know anything about myself at the end. My mom and I didn't speak for a decade. A decade. One of the biggest blessings that I've received in recovery was through working with my sponsor on that relationship. Step, step eight was a huge struggle with trying to set aside what happened by my mom and those people that she exposed me to. I battled long and hard to let go of resentments that I thought I had to hang on to. God and my sponsor never left me as we worked it all out. My sponsor asked me to send a postcard to my mom every single week, just a postcard. I couldn't go to her house on Friday unless I sent the postcard. She even gave me the stamps. She was into it. My mom never once responded. Went on for months and months. Never a response. I knew she got them, though, because my brother told me. After going through that for a while, uh, I grew comfortable with sending her things, and my sponsor very lovingly helped me through having to keep sending them to nobody who was listening. It was hard, but it was a beautiful lesson in pride. I'm so very grateful to say that in time, because of step nine and a whole bunch of steps 10 and 11, my mom and I became the very best of friends for the last several years of her life. It's a miracle of healing that we both had to work very hard for. <laughs> She's in heaven. Steps eight and nine remain so very dear to me because of that healing miracle and many others that came through that step. But she was the big one. My dad and I have had a hard road, but we both keep trying. We are much alike in personality, and that gets in the way. You know how that goes. Um, but I'm grateful that we're able to stay in consistent contact today. Some people are to be loved by a distance, but we love them. Along the road, there were few people that gave me hope. Very few, but they existed. One of them was my dear Uncle Lee, also in heaven. I once asked him a question that continues to change my heart up until today. I asked him, what are the other humans for? And he said, sweet pea, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. It took him several weeks, but he got back to me. And he said, sweet pea, the other humans are for love. Now I was lost. I had nothing then. I had nothing. The other humans were for nothing. I was for nothing. There was nothing. There was nothing. I knew that couldn't happen. I was too cold and they were too mean. I didn't qualify. It, it was like that cloud of I grew up primarily in Minneapolis. At 23 years old, a guy that I barely knew, but he could play guitar, asked me to move to Florida with him. Neither one of us was in any kind of shape to be making major changes in life at that time, but we went. He flew because he had a job, but I had to pack up all this stuff and drive. It took me like two weeks. <laughs> from Minnesota to Florida, it's a long drive, you know? There were many distractions, a few pit stops, you know, things happened, but I ended up in the same dive bar that he was at. We called it fate. Uh, it ended up being, you know, the long trudging road of the end of life as I knew it. Roughly a year later, because was it actually a year or was it two? 
hard to know. Uh, I walked into a 12-step recovery program to find help for him because he really had a problem. And I have ironically stayed in that 12-step recovery program ever since. <laughs> He's visited a few times on and off, so I hear. I don't know if he's still alive or not. Those people didn't know me at all. They, I mean, they didn't even know my name because I lied. But they sincerely wanted to help me recreate a life that was never a life to begin with. They were all about it. They really were. They sp spoke so openly about what happened to them as a result of finding this power that was greater than they were. They said, God saved them. I honestly had no reference whatsoever as to what they were talking about, but I mean, you know, I gave it a shot. I got that sponsor thing, it was creepy, um, and I joined a group. I had never joined to anything before that, trust me, I was a gypsy. Um, my sponsor was at every single meeting I went to. The woman had ESP, like she just showed up wherever I was, poof, there she was. It was bizarre. Um, and she showed me how to live life. I had to change things, because the way that I lived didn't work in a recovery life, and she just helped me like nudge it a little. She, she never took me and went, stop it! She just went, eh, 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 eh. Mm. Oh, oh, back, back, you know. She was cool. She was truly a lifesaver, and taught me how to pray, and how to be accountable. If I didn't call her, whew. You didn't not call her, you just didn't do that. I was incredibly awkward socially, like really bad. And I tried to stick with the guys as I had really no idea how to speak to female humans. I tried to avoid those types. I had a real problem with trust. It is true that some women do suck, but so do some guys. My sponsor and I, had a few long, my sponsor, okay, so, she was sober a while when I came across her life, and she hung out with people who were sober longer than her, and some of them were guys, and, and they had this thing that if any guy came near me, the guy would take him by the shoulder and just walk him over there and tell him, you know what, she is really sick, you don't want a piece of that, trust me. And, and so, <laughs> like, they ruined all of my chances. But honestly, I didn't fight all that hard. I knew that I had to have a new life. I knew that it was done. I knew I couldn't live like that no more. I didn't know if sober was how I was supposed to be living, if this God thing was gonna do anything for me at all. But I knew that I couldn't do that. So, you know, I let them go do that thing. I took some of her suggestions part of the time, and as a result, my recovery was very slow the first few years. Uh, I, I just, I had a hard time listening. I didn't want to hear what she had to say. I knew it all. Ha. I'm grateful that I didn't get, end up, you know, going back to the lifestyle I was in. I really don't know why I didn't. God had other plans. But I did come to find out that a sponsor is only helpful when you call them and take the suggestions. Uh, you know, you can say that you have a sponsor, but if you're not saying it to your sponsor, well then, you're lying. Uh, but anyway, my sponsor today is a steady rock in my spiritual life. And I know that no matter what mistakes I make and what crazy road I go traveling on, she's right there with me saying, huh, really kid, come on, stop it. Uh, you know, she rolls her eyes a lot, uh, but I know that together we, we can get through anything that the devil tries to put in front of us, doesn't matter what it is. Today I trust and love both women and men and have a fair mix of friends. We're commanded to love. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30, we're told, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all of your mind, and with all of your strength. All. Then, in verse 31, Jesus goes on to say that the second commandment is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love and trust are changed in me now. First, I trust Jesus Christ with all that I am, as I am his. His love for me saved me, in that there is no doubt. Because of that, I have the, the ability and the desire to love others today. 
Some people show us that we can trust them and love them, while others show us that we need to remember that we were once loved before we were trustworthy. That doesn't mean we cut them out. It means we love them from over here. There are some bad eggs out there, but they don't tend to hang out in Christian circles for very long. Stick with the ones who have Christ in their walk, not necessarily the ones who just like to say his name. The hardest things that happened in my past have become my greatest strengths today. And I know that that sounds kooky to anybody who's new. You can, you can think that I'm nuts. I don't mind at all. Um, but it's true. My early childhood was very dark and terrible things happened to me by some incredibly sick people. And I pray for those people as well as anybody else they may have harmed along the way. But I tell you that full forgiveness is possible. You can heal and it's amazingly freeing. It takes a lot of work and an amazing amount of strength and courage. But with the help of Jesus Christ and a good sponsor, and the many people who surround us when we're walking through that stuff, we can be free of our hurts. I am. I can never be grateful enough for that, I can tell you that. So back in the day, in the 90s and early 2000s, we went to dinner almost every single night. And there was typically, you know, 15 or more people every night. The unsponsored sat at that end, and the God people sat at the other end, because, you know, you don't want that rubbing off. I usually sat kind of in the middle the first couple of years because I wasn't one of those. I had a sponsor, but I wasn't one of those because they were weird. Um, so I was just kind of taking it all in. And I honestly, I was a quiet person back then. Nobody believes that now if you get like within six inches of me or maybe 25 feet. Uh, nobody believes that I was really very quiet back then, but I was. <laughs> Uh, God has given me a voice and the Holy Spirit sends me to places like this and to these crazy people to talk to. He's done some cool stuff. Anyway, there was one lady who always sat at the very end of the table. She looked like this hippie woman and she was always whispering to the people around her. Pss, 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 pss. You could never hear what she was saying. I honestly thought she was cracked. They, she just missing a couple of loops or something. I don't know. Um, one night I ended up sitting really close to her and she started whispering, and she was whispering this name of some dude that she met that she said made her love all people. She's like, Jesus made me love. I didn't know who that was. I'd never met him. He'd never been at any meeting I was at, so whatever. She was talking about how her whole heart was love because of Jesus. Like, whatever. She was nuts. Uh, I tried to ignore her. I tried to just like turn my back a little bit, strike a, up a conversation here and here, but, but I kept hearing Jesus real soft in my ear. It was like that still soft voice thing. It was really creepy. And uh, it, as it was, the person that was sitting catty corner from her invited me to the Newsboys concert the next weekend and off I went. Um, joy. It was like, it was, you know those, you know those 2 a.m. lights that come on? Boom! You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Well, it was like joy. And I was like, ah! It scared me half to death. And I swore I would never hang out with those people ever again. They were insane. In a way that, I mean, like, I was insane, but, like, we were sane insane, you know? Like, we passed out and nearly died. They were like, joy! Um, so, like, yeah, no. <laughs> Uh, little did I know, Jesus Christ already found a place in my heart. He was drawing me near ever so slow. I am now one of those people at those concerts screaming, joy! Um, so, you know. Fast forward a few years. We got to get out of that newcomer stuff sometime, right? I got married. I went to college. At the time, I was the mom of two little boys. In short, I was crazy from all of life's circumstances and pressures and pulling me in every direction. But I was still sober and I still went to meetings and I stayed active in sponsorship. My then husband brought me to celebrate recovery as he had been invited by a few friends from his recovery meeting. There was that joy again. I stayed away, best I could. But there was a lady named Robin who told me about this Emmaus weekend event that she was leading. She spoke about it like everybody knew all about it, so I went all along because I wanted to fit in. Like, I wasn't going to say, what's that? Heavens no. So I was, oh yeah, no, I'm going, yeah. So I got us signed up, and off he went, and then off I went. 
having no real idea at all what was happening, I was completely unprepared for what was about to take place in my heart. I saw love in the eyes of so many women, just love. I had never seen anything like it before. I knew most of them, but, but I didn't look at them like that before. Watching them serve like that was incredibly humbling. It was just like, yes, I'd like some water. Wow. And, and it wasn't the joy at the concert, it was the joy of the Savior. It was very different. It, it changed things inside of me. Everybody in the place knew the guy named Jesus. I kept thinking he was going to come to a meeting. I wasn't about to tell nobody that I had no idea what they were talking about and that I really was thinking he was going to come around the corner. Well, one morning he did. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, I was rather naive. I really was. I was rather naive, and, and I just didn't know. I mean, I'd never been around you type of people before, uh, so it was different. Um, that weekend, the Holy Spirit began using me to serve him before I even knew him. I was told the entire story of Jesus Christ, and I thought you were lying. I was shocked. I couldn't believe you're like, what? I mean, that was like the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard in my whole life, but I put a smile on my face because like, can't leave for another two days. <laughs> yeah. However, the truth doesn't need my permission in order to be true. And that night, I broke the rules, and as soon as everybody went to sleep, I went out for a walk. And I did something. Oh, if that's for me, do tell them I'm busy. I mean, if that's the kids, I, I, I'm busy. <laughs> really am. Uh, so, no, for real, I really am. <laughs> So are you, actually. The phone's ringing for you who can't hear it. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I went for a walk out into the woods. I like, kept walking and walking. I went off the grounds. I went off into places that I really shouldn't have been. But I asked him, who are you and why are you after my heart? Because I could feel him. I could feel him wanting to be after my heart. I wasn't too pleased about it. And I was rather rebellious. Like, who are you and what do you want? Like, pfft. I honestly didn't think he'd respond. I really didn't. I mean, everybody knew that he was real but me, but like, I was so convinced that the story was made up. Oh, I was wrong. The response was so subtle, so small, that had I not been fighting against it so hard, I would have missed it altogether. I wouldn't even known it happened. Mm -hmm. He literally used my rebellion to prove himself to me. He revealed himself completely, who he was inside of my heart. Huh. The next morning, I was completely afraid to talk because I didn't know what was, like, am I a freak now? <laughs> Just tell me if I'm a freak now. I didn't want to be a freak. You people were freaks, I was normal. Until then. No, but no, not, not to worry, still Kelly. Still sinful, still full of self-pity, still afraid. I was going home exactly the same as I came. Oh, or so I thought. Members of my church uh, asked me to go to the, I really am going to break it, uh, asked me to go on the Curcio weekend a couple of months later. Having heard of Curcio on the Emmaus walk, I thought I knew exactly what was going to go on. Nope. Wrong again. I hope you're seeing a pattern. I'm often quite wrong, especially when it comes to God's plans. Like, yeah, no, honey, go that way. <laughs> I don't want to. Didn't ask you. Right. Uh, I was barely on the ground, and Jesus freaked out inside my heart. I was bawling the whole time. Like, I was just like a sniveling mess. Um, I was given the grace to see who I was to him and to let him, me see him who exactly as he was. That didn't come out right, but you get it, right? <laughs> I am a sinner, and I need my Savior. I need him like air, food, and light, and maybe a little bit more than that. I mean, like, I have to have him. It's an addiction stronger than one that I ever lived in before. It, it's like, I don't know. My hurts came forward that weekend, and I laid them at his feet in a completely different type of a way, and I've left them there. The, 
Though I continue to work the steps to look at where I came from in order to seek a new understanding and to help other women who were hurt like I was, the women of my church held me as I walked through these things. They didn't understand it and I didn't use a whole lot of words, but they could tell that there was some mental and physical and spiritual healing going on. I didn't think it could ever heal, but the process was very deeply begun then and has continued to today. I was safe there and I was so incredibly loved. I barely remember what that emptiness used to be like. Like I can talk about it and I can relate to it when I hear it, but I don't have it. Several years have gone by now. I graduated college, top of my class with honors. I had gold cords, three. I barely graduated high school, but apparently I'm brilliant. Who knew? I mean, like, no, no, seriously, for real. If you turn in the work, you get the grades. That, that's the whole thing. Like, I would have never thought of that. Anyway, my marriage ended, uh, but we built a kind of a friendship so our kids don't live in strife. They don't live in that, you know, divorce for, I hate him, I hate her. No, we're, we're good. He comes for Christmas. I have a simple little life as a single mom. You could see many, many pictures of my kids, most of them when they were young. They're big now, as you saw a couple of times. Anyway, they don't take pictures as much now. They smell. Anyway, I have <laughs> if they ever hear this, they will kill me. I have a few close friends and a few others who I can call at any time who I know that I can trust with my whole entire heart. And I get those calls every once in a while. It fills my heart with gratitude. I do long for the married life, but I have not yet been brought back to it. But I know that Jesus has a plan for my life, and I trust his timing in all things. I'll wait. He's my main squeeze. I'm good. I'm active in my recovery program, attending several meetings a week. I sponsor women who are serious about working the steps, and I'm co-leading a step study on Monday night at my CR. Let me know if you're interested. We've got places open. My church, my CR, Forever family and my recovery home group are deeply embedded in my life. I now shine that joy that that crazy old hippie woman did. I'm not as old as she was then though. <laughs> I still talk to her. Uh, I make mistakes, I sin, I I'm still Kelly, but I run to Abba, I run. I seek forgiveness, I'm so grateful for confession. I, I just, I ask him, Lord, heal me. Help me, I'm so sorry. And he takes me right back. His grace and mercy are new absolutely every morning. He loves his wayward daughter. I was told that the way of the cross is a road that narrows as it goes along. I had no idea what that could possibly mean when I heard it. Like the road narrows, what road? Yeah, I have a de better understanding now. <laughs> What I used to think of as like a bad habit that I ought to not do, something like easy, like cussing or something. Like, well, maybe not that one. I might still do that one. Um, but anyway, those other bad habits, uh, I, I would never dream of doing now. They're so yucky, I'd be like, oh, I'm not doing that. Um, it's, my perspective is just so different. I was earnestly worried, I really was, truly worried that I was going to become some boring old hag if I accepted this savior guy. Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not. I'm way too busy living in joy to be boring. I still get mad at my kids. I still pitch a fit when I don't get what I want. I mean, you know, I do. If you don't, <laughs> or you say that you don't, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> uh, but it usually gets turned around pretty quickly and, and you know, there's hugs all around and stuff like that. You know, there's no sense carrying on and on like the brat that I was. Not that I'm not still a brat, but I'm not like that brat. You know? I've become tender-hearted. From that cold, empty, brutal woman to this tender-hearted little, I mean, like, people call me a sweet church lady. <laughs> they have no idea. I think it's wonderful. I really do. I think it's absolutely wonderful. A verse that has been speaking to me as I prepared for this talk is from Ephesians chapter five, verses eight and nine. It reads, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Thanks for listening to me. Mm -hmm.